So a lot of science done every day on board the International Space Station. A lot done in the year 2015 when two crew members, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko, spent an entire year on board the station, and they're set to come home in about two weeks. Joining me today here in Mission Control, one of the brilliant minds that helps get a lot of that science done on board the orbiting laboratory, Julie Robinson, the chief scientist for the International Space Station program. Julie, first off, thanks so much for joining me today. It's always great to kind of dig in your head and see what's going on behind the scenes to get all this work done. Um, and I want to jump right in if I can. So Scott and Mikhail getting ready to come home in just about two weeks. Give an overview of just some of the stuff they've been doing during this year in space. Like how many investigations have they been, you know, kind of hands on with, even an estimate just over the last year? Yeah, well, over the course of the last year, they've either touched or enabled, Scott, probably about 340 different wow. investigations. There have been about 450 that have gone on in some way, shape, or form over that last year. So it's an incredibly busy place. If you ask Scott to tell you all the experiments he did, he won't be able to remember them. Okay. There's so many going on. It would be a heck of a final exam for him to try and list all <laughs> those, I bet. But uh, So, I mean, that's just the science that's been taking place on board. It's not done once they leave, is it? Like once they come home, there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, to some extent, the crew members themselves are part of the experiment, not just operators of some of the experiments. So a number of different measures have been taken of their bodies um, mm -hmm. to understand the differences that happen to you when you go into space, and especially to design ways to intervene and keep that from happening so that in the future, explorers to Mars uh, will get there healthy and be able to do a successful mission. But the really neat thing is that when we learn about those special things in the space environment, some mm -hmm. of that knowledge gives us something we wouldn't have learned here on Earth, and we bring that back home, and that can make our lives better here as well. All right, and so they're set to come home in two weeks. Scott Kelly, Mikhail Kornienko. So let's, I mean, let's talk specifically about Scott Kelly. Once he comes home, he's still given that data for those experiments on his body, right? How long is that going to continue? Right, so um, there's a, a set of windows of research data that's collected. Mm -hmm. The first data will actually be collected right there in Kazakhstan after Scott and Misha land, and that's for a joint study we have with our Russian investigators called Field Test. Okay. They'll be going through a variety of different tasks that look a lot like what you might have to do if you had just landed on the surface of Mars and needed to connect to a habitat maybe that had been pre-positioned mm -hmm. and there's no one there to help you. They'll climb ladders, they'll connect um, kind of valves and tubing, they may do some programming, they'll look at what would happen if you fell down and had to get back up by yourself. Oh, wow. And then scientists use all of those measurements to help determine if their balance and all of those different countermeasures that we're doing to help them recover from being in space would be suitable for the surface of Mars. Okay. But then after that, there are a series of blood tests, mm -hmm. uh, the crew members will start moving around, they'll do their press conferences, and we have different measurements that continue out. They can go out as far as three years. Three years. De depending on, if the crew members have lost bone, what we found is that um, it can take up to three years to recover base bone mass density. Also what's happening is the bones are remodeling, so the structure mm -hmm. inside the bone and outside the bone is different than when they launched. Hmm. It may be thicker on the outside, more porous on the inside. So to watch that process, takes it takes about three years. It sounds like no rest for the weary. So fortunately, <laughs> they'll have a lot of time in between to do things mm -hmm. as, as we wait to take those final uh, baseline data collection measurements. Okay. Well, to change gears a little bit, so 2015, obviously a very busy year, a great year with the one-year crew on board, but a lot of other stuff happening in the in the world of science on board the International Space Station. Now, you uh, write for an amazing science blog, a lab aloft, which if you're not following uh, NASA blogs online, look it up, a lab aloft, and you came up with, or you came out with four really uh, kind of groundbreaking or very interesting examples from 2015. I'd like to go through those real quick. Oh, sure. And so first off was protein crystal growth. And this is one that we've, we've talked about quite a bit. And it had some really exciting impacts to life right down here on Earth, right? Yeah, the, the pathway from the research result in space to mm -hmm. the benefit back here on Earth, it's a pretty long one. And so this is exciting because this is uh, research that was done several years ago by our Japanese colleagues on okay. the space station. And they flew a lot of different samples of proteins where they thought if we could get a slightly better structure, we might be able to design a drug to help treat a disease. And one of those proteins was in a protein that's important in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Mm -hmm. It's a genetic form of muscular dystrophy, affects about one in 10,000 boys 
boys. Okay. And they were able to get just ever so slightly better structure from a more pure crystal that they grew in space compared to the best structure we had from the ground. Mm -hmm. With that structure, they were able to determine why that protein in people with muscular dystrophy isn't shaped quite right and could be causing the problem. And they invented or they designed a drug that might help to alleviate that. And they went on to testing that designer drug basically in um, first in animal models because there are some, some, some kinds of dogs that appear to have something that is also a genetic defect, looks mm -hmm. a lot like muscular dystrophy, so they tried treating that. It was pretty successful, but just because it works in a, in a different organism yep. for a slightly different disease doesn't mean it's ready for people. And so what's really exciting is they have a set of clinical trials started now with a pharmaceutical company that is interested in uh, developing and marketing the drug further, and those, those trials have started this year. So that's a huge milestone. At this point, the science will tell. Yeah. Up until the clinical trials start, there's politics, there's marketing, mm -hmm. there's business considerations, and sometimes really good science just doesn't make it to the patient. But now, if, if this is a good treatment, it will make it, I think, all the way through, and if it isn't, then we'll know the facts and scientists can go on and look for another. And that's, I mean, that's a really exciting step, and that's benefiting people right down here on the ground. Uh, one of the other things you highlighted, though, was something that we're still trying to solve in space. Now the vision problem is still one of those kind of long poles in the tent for us going to Mars. Astronauts have vision, but not all of them have vision changes. And a paper was just published. Can you talk about that a little bit? Right, so we, it's really just been three or four years since we discovered that some astronauts were having vision changes mm -hmm. and we found some, a very select group of astronauts were actually having permanent serious vision changes that were not recovering when they returned to Earth. And it took time over the space station because not everybody has it. Mm -hmm. Well, one really interesting thing, our nutrition researchers, uh, Scott Smith and Sarah Zwart, noticed a correlation in their nutrition data that the crew members that had vision losses also appeared to have low folate. And they knew that low folate was associated with a specific mutation or a specific polymorphism okay. in people. Now, polymorphism is a fancy word for a different version of a gene. Mm -hmm. Blue eyes is one polymorphism, brown eyes is another. Um, in this case, there are polymorphisms in the one carbon pathway, which is the pathway by which your body makes energy oh, out of its food. Pretty important. Pretty important pathway. <laughs> and uh, some people with a specific version of that gene have um, problems with uh, cardiovascular problems and they also have folate deficiencies. So Scott proposed a study to look at past astronauts that have flown and actually determine their gene for that polymorphism mm -hmm. and then see if they had the vision loss. And those, uh, that paper just came out in January. It had really substantial results they're still correlational, but they mm -hmm. say, hey, it may be that there are these certain genes that are really associated with the astronauts that have the vision loss. It's the first time we've ever done a genetic study of that type with astronauts. So that's a big step. It's a big step. And, uh, you know, people talk about the twin study going on in the one-year expedition. That is the next set of studies that are really looking at uh, genetic impacts on spaceflight. What we do with the information is also pretty compelling because mm -hmm. it's not ethical to take that information and tell someone they can't have their their astronaut job anymore, so yeah. you can't do that. But it does give us all kinds of important scientific information, and it lets crew members know their own personal risk of having a vision impact if they go into space. Yeah. And again, just everything, just trying to make the spaceflight environment safer, you know, for those men and women going up. Now, let's just run through the next two real quick. So, Rapid Scat, one of our external payloads, has been making a couple of big splashes, and there was one with heat pipes, which you're going to have to re-enlighten me on. <laughs> okay. Well, so Rapid Scat is one of our external instruments. Yep. It's mounted outside the ISS. It's looking down at the Earth. It replaces an instrument on the QuickScat satellite that um, failed. Mm -hmm. And what this instrument does is it looks at the speed of winds right at the surface of the ocean. And okay. scientists at NOAA use that data to model hurricane eyewall recycling. So when there's a hurricane coming ashore, there are two things you want to know, right? Where is it going to come ashore and how yeah. strong is it going to be? And how do I get out of here? <laughs> okay, three things you want to know in Houston. But uh, so the, the big global models mm -hmm. of the big winds and the big high and low pressure system, that tells you kind of where it's going to go ashore. But the eye wall recycling is what tells you how strong it's going to be. Because gotcha. if it hits at the right time in the eye wall cycle, it's maybe a category three. If it hits at the worst time, it could be a category five. And, and these uh, data from the rapid scan instrument feed into that process. Mm -hmm. And they're helping us do better modeling of all the hurricanes. And so all last year, every hurricane, we had more information due to that rapid scat instrument. Fascinating. 
Okay, well, I mean, just to, just to wrap it up, just to close, we've had 15 years now, over 15 years of people on station, science taking place on station. What's kind of your peak over the horizon of what's coming up? Well, to me, I think one of the most important things we're seeing is the growth of ISS as a national lab. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of different pharmaceutical companies that are planning on doing experiments. Eli Lilly, uh, you talked about Bass M, which is Millican. A number of companies coming forward and using that unique environment to innovate and to develop better ways to solve problems back here on Earth. And I think seeing that growth as as in parallel as we go along with uh, understanding spaceflight better mm -hmm. makes the space station just really unique. All right. Well, again, Julie Robinson, the chief scientist for the International Space Station Program, giving us a look at some of the big highlights from 2015 and what's ahead. Thank you so much for joining me, Julie. It's always informative. It's always great to talk to you. Always great to be here.